All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Solana ecosystem here today. You're going to get a half hour of me, and then you're going to get a half hour of Emmett talking about this little thing, which is the Saga, which is the new Web3 phone that Solana Mobile has launched. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and talk about the Solana ecosystem in general. So if you're familiar with the network architecture, a lot's changed, so we're going to go over a bunch of stuff today. Um, we're going to start out with kind of the mission and vision of the Solana network, which is a decentralized blockchain that is built for mass adoption. It's built to be scalable and for user-friendly dApps to be buildable on it so you can run all of the world's infrastructure, if you'd like to, on the network. And so one of the biggest changes here, as we all know about crypto, is it's the direct ownership of both applications and assets on chain. Uh, a lot of the problems today that are facing blockchain, though, are that they do not have the cost profiles, the speed, and the security profiles needed for this kind of application and work. And so scalability is the biggest factor preventing markets and users from leveraging blockchains to solve all sorts of problems all around the world. And we see this, right? That a lot of the blockchains that exist today, they do really, things really well, but those things come with trade-offs. They come with large fees to transact on the network. They come with limited capacity. They come with centralization through L2s and scaling solutions. And so Solana is a very different take on how to build a blockchain than you see from some of the folks that are building things that are EVM compatible or in the Ethereum world. So transactions on Solana, this is actually a little bit of an overestimate. They're 0 0.00025 cents uh, for the average transaction on Solana. Um, you know, the network is benchmarked at up to 65,000 transactions per second, but what you steadily see in a normal day is somewhere between three and 5,000 transactions per second. This is partially due to the complexity of transactions, and just as the network scales, uh, that number increases. Um, we're seeing consistent throughput at scale. If you look at the reliability of sending transactions and the ability for that transaction to land, Solana is settling more transactions than any other blockchain in the world, and I think most blockchains combined We'll get into that stuff a little bit later. Um, it's the highest proof of stake coefficient of, uh, sorry, Nakamoto coefficient of any proof of stake network. So this is a measurement of how decentralized a network is based on the distribution of validators and the number of validators that you would need to compromise to cause a problem on the network. So one of the other pieces here to look at is when you build really efficient infrastructure, it also ends up being incredibly carbon friendly. So Solana is the most, uh, the, uses the least amount of energy and has the lowest carbon impact per transaction of any chain, uh, which is about two Google searches for one transaction versus energy usage. We also carbon neutralize the network by buying offsets from the foundation, uh, which is a pretty cheap endeavor given how green the network is. So these are a few of the areas that we've seen a lot of growth on in the, air, in the network over the last year or so. So we're starting to see a lot more work done in gaming. and you'll, one of the things you'll notice about all of these different types of uh, areas is they all require a high throughput of transaction, and they all require very low transaction fees. And these are largely the kind of applications you can't build elsewhere. So for gaming, right, most games built on blockchain are not actually built on blockchain. There's one small part of the game that's built on blockchain, like the NFT or some reward token, and the rest of the thing is actually built offline. If you look at Star Atlas, they actually announced something just today um, where the moves, they're building like a strategy game on chain, and the moves that a player makes to like move their ship from one square to another, that's recorded on chain as a transaction. This is like actual on-chain gaming, and we're getting to a stage there where that stuff is super compelling, and that's not really being built elsewhere. Social primitives and social applications are also getting built on chain. This is ways to take the, some of the thesis of Web 2 that didn't work out, right? This idea that you can build smaller social networks in Web2, like House Party or Nextdoor or you know, Trivia at HQ, any of these types of things that never really found product market fit in the Web2 world, they actually are viable to build on chain because you have different economics behind it. But as we all know, social, there's a lot of likes, there's a lot of clicks, there's a lot of posting. You need high throughput and you need really low transaction fees to make something like that possible. Decentralized physical infrastructure networks are another area where you start to see this. So Helium, which is the world's largest decentralized physical infrastructure network, they run both 5G cell phone hotspots and uh, like LoRa WAN, which is this low power, really long range network. Um, there's about a, a million of the LoRa networks and about 8,000 of the 5G networks all over the country run by people out of their house. This is decentralized physical infrastructure. And this is kind of a crazy concept that a bunch of people doing stuff in their house 
can actually provide infrastructure that is as strong as centralized infrastructure providers like a Verizon or a T-Mobile. And this is uh, something that people thought was impossible, the same way people thought decentralized finance and Bitcoin was impossible before we actually did it. So we're starting to see like, the basis of what a lot of this stuff could turn into in the future. People are setting up their own cell phone antennas to run cell phone internet service for their local communities that have not been serviced by the large providers. But they don't have to provision everything themselves. They don't have to go through the process of setting up their own LTE network and getting licenses. It's all built in through something like Helium. Hive Mapper is another example of this. They're competing with Google Street View by having people put dashboard cameras in all of their, in all these cars. People who drive Ubers are often using this sort of thing. And it rewards you in tokens for getting pictures of streets. Now, if you've been on, gone on Google Street View, you've probably seen the problem of, oh, this image hasn't been updated in four years because the Google car only drives by once or twice. So this is an area where people putting cameras in their car and driving around is actually going to create a much more complete data set of what a road and street looks like, let alone when you start leveraging AI on top of that to model these things, than what a centralized provider can provide. So these are just a few of the areas that you're seeing a ton of interesting growth across the network. Um, DeFi is where the network was born. It continues to be super strong on the network. And we'll get into payments and NFTs in a bit, because there's a lot going on there. Um, these are a few recent highlights of sort of Web2 uh, companies and partnerships that are getting built on the network. We have Google Cloud. We have Discord, Stripe, some music recording programs, and ASICs. Um, we'll go into a bunch of these more. But the truth of Solana is that developers are the backbone of the ecosystem. And the ecosystem is really big. It's, uh, it's big enough you can't even fit it on a screen this big. Um, this is just a small sampling of the applications that are built on the network today. And what you see is, you know, when I joined uh, Solana in January of 2021, there were 35 applications that had transactions running through them per day on the network. Today we're over 1,500. That is some of the highest numbers of any applications in blockchain, and these are real contracts too. This is not like 45 copies of the NFT contract getting deployed, because part of Solana's programming model is program reusability. So that means everyone minting an NFT, they're going through the same minting contracts. So these, are, these are truly 1,500 plus contracts with daily active transactions through them. We are second now in developer growth across the active developers. Uh, this is a pretty insane uptick. Uh, we're only behind Ethereum in this regard. This is from the Electric Capital Report, which is the most hated developer report out there, which means you know it's the most accurate one. Every single protocol complains and undercounts them. Uh, this also only counts open source developers, and so it doesn't count people who work at like Coinbase and exchanges. But this is pretty much the best data set you can find on ordinarily how are people ranked in terms of developer interest and adoption. And Solana continues to have one of the fastest growing developer adoptions here. Uh, you know, last year was, was pretty wild. We did these things called hacker houses, which are these big uh, you know, IRL activations where developers can come, they can learn about the network, people can come and find jobs and engage with each other. We did 22 of these last year um, in 22 cities around the world. Plus, we have a big conference every year called Breakpoint. Um, there's 26,000 people that came through them. There are over 600 demos given. And this is sort of the moving of what was a community very much built during COVID into an, uh, a community that also meets in real life. So Solana launched in March of 2020. That was when the mainnet launched. It was about the worst time you could possibly launch a mainnet as the world was shutting down. And so as what we've seen is that these, these hacker houses, there'll be people meeting for the first time who've been working with each other and coding with each other for years, but they haven't actually ever met in person before. So it's really interesting to see. Before we go on, I do want to talk about the FTX blow up, the supposed death sentence of the Solana network. Uh, you know, if you read headlines in uh, you know, late November, mid-November, you would have thought that Solana was done for and you'd never see any activity on the network again. What we've actually seen is that there was, a, there was a cool down period, certainly, right? You look at this chart, there's about six weeks or so where people were like, I don't know, may, like, let's, let's see what's going on. And we, we saw that reflected in on-chain activity. And then what we saw is that people trusted the community. And we see this activity massively spiking as we go into the new year here. Um, we actually now have more developers building on Solana than pre-FTX. There's more validators than before FTX uh, exploded. And a lot of the fear that this was somehow going to bring down the network or that FTX was critical to any of the operations has now been really disproven. 
And so this is one of the coolest things for us to see is that this is a, a network and a community that is resilient to even the most adverse conditions within crypto. Um, so you can check out the new version of this chart too. This is as January 6th. It's even better looking now. Uh, this comes from Masari too, which is an independent analytics firm. So this is all about pushing the cutting edge of what's possible on the network. So network performance is something that we care deeply about at the Solana Foundation and the engineers that are in the core engineering group. Um, performance is the guiding benchmark of what Solana aims for. One of the things that is really interesting to think about when you're thinking about how networks are architected is what are they trying to achieve? What are the goals that drive the development of the network? And so there's this, there's this sort of ruthless pragmatism in how Solana is built. It was not built to be EVM compatible. right? It was not built to be EVM compatible because there are limitations on EVM. And those trade-offs, every network has trade-offs. Every language has trade-offs. EVMs may be the right set of trade-offs for you. But if you're trying to build an incredibly fast blockchain with incredibly low fees, today that's not possible on EVM due to the architecture of how EVM works. So Solana actually takes a radically different approach where you take the VM layer and the consensus layer and they're merged into one single layer which is a totally different architecture system than you see in other places. Uh, that brings with it a ton of advantages. So what you see in these charts is you see block production time decreasing, and you see the transactions per second increasing as a function of that. These are pretty, pretty technical detailed charts, but there's some major upgrades that were shipped last year. So QUIC is a new networking technology that the network changed to uh, last year. Stake-weighted QoS is a way of metering and filtering transactions coming into a validator that allows for transactions with a higher economic value to be prioritized if users want them to. And this rolls right into local fee markets. So we're all familiar with the fee markets you see on most blockchains where you have a gas fee to send a transaction. And that fee, you know, if you want to send it instantly, it might be more money. If you want to wait a few minutes, it's less. If you're willing to have the transaction clear whenever, it's lower. But these are universal fee markets. So if I'm buying an NFT and you're trying to swap some USDC for USDT, those fees are the same. Because fundamentally, on most networks, what you're metering for is scarcity. There's a very limited number of transactions that can get through. And so there's economic competition for that entire block. Block space is very limited on most chains. On Solana, block space is abundant. So there's a whole different structure you have to work with here. The competition to mint an NFT, right? If we're, try if we're all trying to mint the same NFT drop because we really want to get you know, this NFT drop, that's where you start to see competition and fees spike. But those fees are going to spike just in that one market. It's not going to affect the cost of doing a, you know, a trade somewhere else on the network or entering a DeFi position or updating you know, something else you're trying to do or gaming on the network. So these local fee markets allow for market pricing to work just where it has to instead of taking over the entire space. Because again, what we're talking about here is a blockchain that has very abundant block space as opposed to something that runs into scarce and more limited resources. Additional investments being made are a second validator client. So Ethereum today is the only network that has multiple validator clients for smart contract blockchains. Um, Solana is the first network after Ethereum to be building a fully independent second validator client. And this is important for a few reasons. One, it's a doomsday security preventer, right? So if there's a zero-day bug somewhere in a validator client, um, that could potentially corrupt the whole state of a network. This is true on every blockchain. This is why there's multiple uh, clients for Ethereum today as well. So by adding a second client to Ethereum, it's not o uh, to Solana here, it's not only a major performance improvement. It's based on a different programming language. Solana's, uh, Solana Labs client, the main client today, is built in Rust, which is a great programming language. This is built in C. And so by building it in a different programming language, you have a different set of dependencies and a different set of uh, vulnerabilities. So if there's a problem on one implementation on, let's say, the Solana Labs client, the chance that it's going to be on the Firedancer client as well is basically zero. And so by having multiple versions of these validator clients running, you dramatically increase the resiliency of a network to a doomsday scenario. It doesn't necessarily prevent a network from halting in an adverse condition, but it's a state protection piece that's really important for the long-term stability and decentralization of a network. So it's super cool that Solana is the first network after Ethereum to have a second validator client coming to it. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, some like the Gito Labs client, which is a MEV-based client, similar to Flashbots on Ethereum. That's an independent client too, but since it's based on the same stack, we don't quite count it that way. 
There's also new token features coming to the network this year. So there's privacy preserving transaction features which are coming. Uh, this is sort of a way to do what's called confidential payments. So you could still see that me and someone else transacted, but the contents of how much money or tokens were moved in that transaction would be encrypted using both users' keys. That's a really interesting thing to see. Transfer fees. Um, one of the things that we really commonly hear is that royalties on uh, NFTs have been a huge success for creators. They've actually allowed creators to make sustainable livings on blockchain in a way that like, no one thought was really possible before. Uh, transfer fees are going to enable that sort of thing for other types of assets on chain. Maybe this is real world assets that are not represented as an NFT or other types of tokens. Um, this also has the ability for developers to set a fee to use a smart contract, which is another interesting opportunity for developers that right now it's a fee based system usually based on a percentage. But you could have a flat fee to transact on an order book instead of having that be a percentage fee of the total order value. Um, you know, if you're doing a really big transaction on chain, if you're trying to move a few million dollars through a, uh, you know, an order book or something like that, paying based on percentage is a very uh, tradfi model, right? Things in blockchain don't necessarily need to be metered based on percentages. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff we're, we're kind of working on here. New NFT features, again, cost reduction, royalty enforcements, trade swapping programs are really interesting too. It basically, uh, you know, I've been joking this is really called Mr. Potato Head, right? It's the idea that you can take your NFT and you can add a hat to it, you can add a bunch of other things to it. These are really primitives that could lay the groundwork for new types of gaming, where you could take something like the incredibly profitable, successful model of Fortnite, where you have you know, IP coming from all sorts of companies all around the world into a video game. You can build that on chain. You can take IP that's native to Web3 and you can bring that into games you're building on chain as well. So I, that's something I'm pretty excited to see coming out. We'll be talking more about Solana Mobile, so I'm going to skip over the slide because I don't have a ton of time left. Um, but NFTs on Solana, they're one of the massive breakout successes for the network. And I think it's worth saying this was accidental. Um, Solana was not conceived of as a network that was going to be great for NFTs. It was conceived of as being the fastest neutral base layer you can create. And it just so happens when you build an incredibly fast chain that has really low transaction fees and really fast finality, a bunch of DGENs show up and mint JPEGs. And so uh, what we see from this is incredible NFT activity. So in just about a year and a half, we've had over 31 million NFTs minted. Uh, 2.7 million wallets actually hold NFTs on the network. And it's growing pretty steadily. Again, another chart from Masari here. Activity continues to be strong across the network. And you know, honestly, the secondary market volumes are, are pretty impressive to see. I'll skip over a few of these because we don't have a ton of time. Um, but this is one of the most exciting slides, I think, for me. So this is looking at creator royalties on the network. So over $170 million have been paid out to artists on secondary market royalty transactions on the network. Um, these are really cool numbers, right? The, the only reason YouTube is a viable platform today is because creators get a share of the royalties that take place on it. This doesn't, but this kind of royalty enforcement system doesn't exist in the traditional art markets for the most part. This is actually a new functionality that blockchain brings to all sorts of artists and musicians. And I think it's really interesting to see that this kind of work can lay a ground model for up and coming artists and musicians to potentially skip the entire web to like pipeline. They can skip uh, Spotify, they can skip Tidal, they can go straight to publishing their content on Web3. And if you talk to artists nowadays, they largely don't like the big platforms. And there's a reason for that. They get paid less than they used to get paid. And even like Netflix. Netflix does not pay people who are in their shows the same royalties that Hollywood used to pay people. And so we're seeing the business models of blockchain support actually building artist-friendly economic models, which is uh, something very exciting to see. So there's a ton of uh, primitives and, and tooling to make this stuff possible on the network. Um, you can mint NFTs in minutes. It's about 12 cents to create an NFT. Uh, this one gets a little bit technical here on how to do stuff. But there's also, this is kind of the, the landscape of what's available for tooling. So Metaplex is the main contract that folks use to mint NFTs. Uh, Squads is a really great multi-sig program for securing token metadata on NFTs. Tons of other stuff to check out here. Uh, this is also another uh, important chart to look at. This is the cost of minting NFTs on Solana compared to several other popular chains. Uh, you can see the pricing data in the corner for when this data was taken, so you can compare it uh, for yourself. Uh, Solana in Q1, right? just beforehand, you can see the cost of minting 
various numbers of NFTs on chain. The one I want to draw your attention to is Solana today in that bottom corner down there. 100 million NFTs on chain for about $1,500. So this is using something called state compression, which is another new technology that's been shipped on the network. This is cheap enough levels of pricing that every item in a video game can be minted as an NFT, and the company won't even notice on their balance sheet. These are disruptive costs. I mean, you can, you can check the cost relative to minting on Ethereum or other networks there to see just how disruptive we're talking about from a cost performance perspective. Uh, so this, this is called state compression, is the technology that enables this. These are called compressed NFTs. They're supported on all the wallets on the network today. And this just rolled out a few weeks ago. So it's really cool to see this kind of like innovation and disruptive pricing model that's available. Uh, this is not you know, something where it takes a ton of technical expertise to implement this. This is just the stuff you can do uh, very easily when you're minting NFTs. And so what do we think this is going to be used for? I don't think anyone's going to do a 100 million JPEG NFT collection. Maybe they are. If you're thinking about it, I would love to talk to you. Um, but primarily, this is something like if we're taking real world financial assets and putting them on chain, if you're taking bonds and putting them on chain, if you're taking things that need to be represented as actual actual data with metadata, right? A one loan is not compatible to another loan the way one Bitcoin and one Bitcoin are the same thing. You need to know about the identity and the metadata associated with each of these types of things. So by making it possible to mint 100 million NFTs for $1,500, that changes the types of things you can do in DeFi, in gaming, in social, in all these different areas we were talking about. Uh, and so you know, Helium, when Helium migrated its layer one, they left their existing L1, they moved the entire project to Solana, they minted all million of their hotspots as NFTs using compression. And you know, again, if you look at the chart here, that was somewhere around $150 to do that, which is incredible when you think about that. So again, a lot of slides for a much longer deck when I have much more time. Great. So here's a list of sort of uh, what a little bit of the landscape looks like for compression right now. Some of the applications that are supporting it, both on the Metaplex side, on the Solana side, and then the, uh, the wallets that are supporting this thing as well. One I do want to draw attention to here is this guy. Uh, which is Backpack. Uh, Backpack is a whole new framework for how to build applications on Solana. It's a wallet, sort of. It's an app store, sort of. It's a lot of different things at the same time. But one of the coolest innovations they've come up with is something called XNFTs. And the X stands for executable. So one of the biggest problems you see today in Web3 is that a bunch of it is still Web2. Every website you go to, that whether it is a, uh, you know, a marketplace for NFTs, whether it is a DeFi protocol, a social protocol, whatever, that's all hosted usually on Cloudflare or AWS, which means you have to register an entity. You have to get a business license. You have to get a business account. There's all of this stuff that if you want to build something in Web3, you're actually forced into the Web2 traditional system in order to host the website. Even though all your smart contracts are decentralized and on-chain, you have to get a DNS resolver. All of that work that has to be done is still solidly in the Web2 space. So what XNFTs let you do is you can actually distribute entire React Native applications inside of an NFT. And that can be rendered in real time locally by the wallet. So it's a lot of technical words. Uh, you can run the entire Uniswap front end locally. I can build a custom interface for the Uniswap front end if I want to. You don't have to worry about, oh, is the SEC going to get mad at me for hosting these certain kinds of tokens on the Uniswap front end and have to create a totally different version of the Uniswap front end to like, eliminate some of these tokens that maybe regulators don't necessarily want. By running the user running it locally, you eliminate the liability issues of the centralized company that's registered the website having to perform these types of operations. You can build games on chain now, and the game can be entirely within a React Native experience. You can sell software licenses, for lack of a better term, via XNFTs. There's entirely new models for both how to build things, how to decentralize things, and how to monetize things that XNFTs enable. So that literally shipped, I think, a week ago. Uh, it's incredibly exciting to see the work that the Backpack team is doing with XNFTs. Uh, I want to talk about payments briefly, too, because payments are another system where you need fast, cheap transactions. Right? If uh, We all remember when chip credit cards first came out, and you put it in the machine, and you waited like five seconds, and then it would finally scream at you with a loud beeping noise, and you could pull your chip out. That was a terrible experience. Everyone hated chip cards because they were slow. So if we're actually going to start using payments in blockchain, 
day to day to buy coffee, to do basic transactions, what you're really looking at here is you need a network that is incredibly fast finality. The number most people think of is somewhere around three seconds is the longest someone's going to wait for payment confirmation. And usually it's about half a second, right? If, think about the last time you pressed an application on your phone and when did you hit it again? It was probably not three seconds. It was probably later than that if it didn't respond. And so our brains have this timeline of about half a second in their head of, a, of how long something should take. A third of a second is about the fastest anyone expects. A half a second is about when people start to lose interest. So if you're talking about payments, you need a network that can settle in 400 milliseconds, right? That's less than half of a second. And so when you look at these, compar these comparative systems here, you see that the finality time, which is what someone actually needs to be comfortable saying, yes, you can walk out of the store with this iPad, right? If you're selling an expensive product, you don't want to have to wait for finality before you're we're willing to let the person transact. That might be fine if you're buying a house on chain, but if you're buying coffee, no one wants to sit in the lobby for 20 minutes while they uh, wait to see if their payment cleared. So USDC on Solana is kind of leading the charge on payments, but we're seeing a huge amount of growth in international stable coins as well, especially as a lot of the interest in that sort of technology moves offshore nowadays. So this is just one example of this. ASICS, the shoe company, um, did a shoe drop uh, on Solana. They teamed up with Step In, which is one of the games built on Solana that uses sneakers and sort of encourages you to walk. And they sold these $200 shoes. They took USDC on Solana. The company was able to get $199.9975 of the $200 you spent, which if you've ever used a credit card as a merchant side, they take about 2.8% of that. So this is a massive savings for a company like ASICS, and they also could accept payments from anywhere in the world. They didn't have to worry about, oh man, do we have a local credit card processor that can accept South Korean-issued American Express cards? They just used USDC. And this kind of unlock is really interesting for merchants that both have global distribution and have high enough volumes that the percentage fees that they pay on credit cards are a remarkable number in their businesses and their revenue. So these were a really cool project that they worked on. Again, confidential payments are coming, and confidential payments are a really important part of this. If you're a publicly traded company, you don't want to leak your earnings data before it happens. Uh, so being able to have confidential payments means that no one's going to be able to just look at your wallet and see how much USDC you have coming in and estimate what your payments might be. So we're really building a stack here that is kind of open for enterprises. Um, this is a more detailed explanation of these stuff that we have three minutes left, so we're not going to get into today. Um, so this is kind of where we're at with the state of, of technology on Solana. There's a ton of work being done to move things really quickly on the network. And there's one thing we haven't talked about today, which is some of the reliability issues that we've seen on the network, especially last year. So when you're building a network from the ground up, right, not based on the existing EVM tooling that exists, there are things that are just going to go wrong. And that is not the goal, right? But there's a trade-off here between how quickly you're innovating on a platform and the stability you're able to provide. Solana offers 99.7% uptime, which is better than most Web2 services. It's not good enough today. It's one of the most important things the engineering team is working on, is how to increase that resiliency of the network. Um, but in the, just that period of time, we've shipped 10 massive upgrades to the network in about 14 months. And so that pace of innovation is really why developers are building on the network today. They trust it's going to be cheap today. They trust it's going to be cheap five years in the future because of the scaling models built into the network. And so that's kind of the, the trade-off today. And we're moving from a world of move really fast and occasionally break things to focusing a little bit more on reliability but continuing to push the pace of innovation just maybe a little bit slower than before. Because it is true that you need to be able to trust the layer that you're building on. Now, one of the interesting things about this is, of course, because it's a blockchain, when AWS goes down, the only people that can bring that thing back up are the Amazon engineers. When a blockchain goes down, everyone has the state available. Everyone can verify the current state of the network. They can verify their balance is OK. And this is why things like light clients are a really important innovation on networks today. So hope you enjoy this. It's just a brief overview of some of the work that's taking place on Solana today. Uh, Emmett will be up soon from Solana Mobile to talk about this wild, crazy thing, which is a blockchain phone that has uh, a hardware wallet embedded inside of it. So, thanks.